what you're gonna do. You can't fight the future. Wrestling God. ProWrestlingRadio.com presents. Are you talking to me? Pro Wrestling Radio. Live. Online. You think The Rock actually cares? What is he doing here? Oh, it's true. I'm bringing everybody with me. The Rock That's hard time. The Vita Man. Call in with a question or comment. Six, one, can you feel it? I hate your ever hold the damn phone. Call three at 1-877-800-8834. That's how I roll. Your sex at the big day. Come get some because I've done all of that. And now your host of the show. The king is back on his throne. Eric. Excuse me. Gargiulo. And that's the bottom line. Because Stone Cold said Get started. So. Eric Gargiulo with Bret Hart for Pro Wrestling Weekly. Bret, you've just put out a book. And what I want to know is what inspired you to write that book? Uh, I just wanted to capture some of the sort of my great uh, accomplishments that I've made in wrestling and put them all put it back out there in the light again, shed some light on different opponents from Steve Austin to Goldberg to you name it. Right, right. What was it like growing up in a wrestling family? Oh, it was interesting. <laughs> I bet. At least, you know, I was around a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting characters. I really have a very uh, interesting perspective, I think, of, of the entire business and, and, and a really long one. It's funny because my dad has such an interesting perspective on the business. He's 85 right. and he's been in it so long but uh, when I think about it, I've been involved in wrestling since I was about four years old. Wow. And every every Friday I was either working in some capacity in, in wrestling from selling programs to refereeing to, to eventually uh, wrestling and, and, and doing it forever it seems. Really. Right. But it was interesting. Uh, we all had a passion for it. I think the whole family was, uh, you know, thrived on uh, the weekly uh, wrestling show. Huh. Interesting. Now, um, as I'm sure most of the, the wrestling public know, you're currently out with a concussion. What is the status right now of your injury, and are there still any contemplations of retirement for you? Uh, well, certainly a possibility. Okay. Uh, I'm reasonably optimistic that uh, at this point... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really in the middle. It's, it's something that's still, um, it's still lagging in me. It, it, it's affected my speech and my. Uh, there's a lot of complications that come from concussions that maybe not that might not seem apparent to to people on the outside. Uh, I've had a, a headache for four and a half months. Wow. That uh, still doesn't go away. It gets smaller, and sometimes it's like you know you can live with it. Yeah. Uh, but it's. You know, just the thought right now of me sort of being body slammed or taking any kind of, even a remotely light fall in a wrestling match is, is difficult for me to imagine right now. So it is a question whether or not I can come back. Uh, I have a lot of similarities, I think, with my concussion as uh, uh, Eric Lindros. Yeah, absolutely. And since we're doing the show in Philly here, everybody's very familiar with that. Yeah, it's, it's a, like Eric Lindros, I know he kind of got chastised for say, making comments about the medical team or something like that. Yeah, he did. <laughs> and the truth is, is when as I'm going through the similar thing, like, sometimes you can't necessarily make the point that you're trying to make. Right. And I'm not defending him more, because I don't know what he said, and maybe, maybe he clearly meant it. But you, you're in a, you have an inability to be able to focus on your, um, really, sometimes your brain is just so messed up that you can't, uh, you know, it, I've found myself saying things that I didn't quite come out the way I wanted them to. Right. And I had good intentions behind the, the comment kind of thing, but yeah. it's really hard. It's a, it's a, it's a really bad injury and it really is, uh, it's, it's been the scariest injury I've ever gone through. And, uh, I, I really certainly relate to Eric Landros and I hope that, like, like myself, I hope that we both play again. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I wish you well there. Um, you do a weekly column up there in Calgary, and you had mentioned before you had made your Nitro appearance that you were surprised, it seemed in your column, that you were surprised that they had asked you back. Why were you so surprised? Well, I just, you know, you know, I never see myself being able to fit in. You mean that you're talking about the last couple of weeks? Yeah. Yeah, I just, I don't, I, I, it's really hard for me to imagine fitting in with uh, being limited to what I'm 
able to do. I'm not. I still can't lift weights. I still can't uh, uh, do anything too intense. Right. I know I swung a chair on uh, Monday night. Right. That's about all I can do. I can't. Um, I can't do much. I'm, I'm really uh, uh, in a in a bad position that way. I, I want to do more. Right. But anything you do, really, just especially the more physical you want to try to be. Like, I'll give you an example. Sure. If my phone rings, i got to sort of walk over and get the phone. If I race up the stairs and, you know, spin around the corner and grab the phone, I can do all that. Right. Uh, it's not like my brain doesn't work or anything. It, it's just that if you start to really do intense things, by the end of the day, you, you start to get a really bad headache. You're, you, everything sort of um, goes backwards. You take a few steps back. Right. So you have to keep being very calm all the time and not doing anything to... to to stress yourself out, it's really tough. I, I've become a vegetable almost. <laughs> it's hard for me to be able to do that. I can, I, I can understand where you're coming from. And again, not not to harp on the Eric Lindros situation, but um, to, to give you a little insight on it, his whole defense here was he kind of tiptoed around the issue without coming out and saying he had a concussion because he he didn't want to be labeled a baby, more or less, and, and he felt pressured not to admit that he had a concussion. And let me ask you, did you feel pressured to come back? Uh, was this a decision that you made 100% or, or how did that even come about? What I've done I w is has been safe enough. Like it, I wouldn't do anything that would uh, complicate my concussion. But uh, I will say that I, I had a concussion on the. I got it around the t December twentieth pay per view in uh, Starcade with Goldberg. Right. I wrestled for three more weeks after that, and I agree with uh, Eric Lindros that maybe they were negligent and uh, like they're the ones that when you have a concussion. And I think they were well aware that he had a concussion or it was a concern of everybody. So, right. Um, I can't do the thinking. It's like uh, my brain was messed up. Uh, I found myself doing stunts. I found myself being choke slammed and power bombed uh, night after night for almost three weeks. Right. And telling everyone every night, I have a. Con I think I have a concussion. <laughs> Don't take that into account. And I bet it wasn't very far off from, from Eric Lindros. They want him to play. They want him to do stuff. Yeah. And you want to be there for the team. But you lose the ability to diagnose yourself. Yeah. And I've been told that right from the start. I, I, I couldn't believe I was as hurt as badly as I was. And I was actually somewhat skeptical. But I realized over a few weeks that I was forgetting everything. I, I would, you know, it, it, all of a sudden it just dawns you know, how really messed up you really are. Yeah. And then the fear sets in that it's never going to go away. And uh, I, I relate a lot to Eric Lindros and I have a lot of sympathy for him. And I, I, I think that the Philadelphia fans and maybe I think the fans do but I think the management should uh, reconsider their position I, I think uh, to be hard on him for he, he must be going through a really difficult time because uh, your brain is just so out of whack right and it's hard to be held accountable for what you say and for what you think yeah but it's not far off from the truth with Eric Lindros yeah, and um, again, not to be the dead horse, uh, the, the fans um, seem to be more sympathetic and understanding than, than the management does. And I guess being in wrestling for so long, you can relate with all the shady promoters that I'm sure you've worked with throughout the years. Yeah, well, I just think some, you know, concussions are really, um, you know, I got this from my doctor, who's the head of the NHL Players Association for okay. concussions. And, uh, you know, in the old days, they just pat you on the back and push you back out for another, uh, you know, another shift kind of thing. And, you know, maybe Bobby Clark, that's how he did it, you know, but that's, it's, a you know, concussion is, um, been fearful of is losing my memories and, and some of my, my uh, most cherished, uh, memories. All right. To, to lose a couple extra matches and just isn't important. And it really, did, it really is easy to rock your brain. I rocked my brain so bad that, uh, uh, I forgot home phone numbers of people that I've called every day for years. <laughs> Wow, that's you know, it's just really bad. That, that's wild. I got to ask you um, again with the concussion recently. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of it because if I'm aware of it, you have to be aware of it. That Hulk Hogan recently did an interview where it didn't seem like it was any kind of an angle where where he he sort of made fun of your concussion, saying something that you couldn't even remember the letters WCW. Um, are you aware of that? And and what are your feelings on something like that? Well, he's probably if he said it. I I, I only know he Hulk the way I do that 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 it was meant because it's true. Yeah. I, I had trouble remembering um, 
when they first diagnosed me with a concussion, they gave me five random words to, to remember. They were going to ask me in five minutes. You know, they clearly said, we're going to ask you these five words in five minutes. Right. Uh, I couldn't remember any of the words five minutes later. Yeah. And that's when I realized, like, okay, I have a really bad concussion. Right. I thought when they told me that it would be anywhere from two weeks to nine months, that they were probably closer to two weeks or maybe or less. Right. Um, two and a half months later, I realized that I was really still messed up. And I've learned to um, really appreciate what everything, every single thing that the doctors tell me. I'm like totally uh, whatever they want. Uh, I will not go in the ring and jeopardize my health anymore because I've lost the, like my doctor told me, I've lost the ability to diagnose myself. It's right. like taping up your knee or your ankle or your, you know, you got a sore shoulder and you sort of know what you're limited from a pain threshold. You know what you're con- capable of doing. Right. But with your brain and your con- a concussion, um, it's a whole different thing. You can't even, you know, you, I was, I was capable of walking across eight lanes of traffic. Uh, you, know, you could have pointed me in a direction, had me do just about anything. Yeah. And I thought I had control of what I was doing, but I, I was totally, totally out of whack. And, uh, I'm glad that I've taken myself out of that and I'm just going to let my doctors decide what I do. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, uh, everybody's very well aware of the new regime back in WCW, Vince Russo and Eric Bischoff. I had Terry Taylor on the program a couple weeks ago, and we talked about them coexisting, their different personalities. As somebody yourself that has worked for both and extensively, do you think they can coexist, and do you think they can make a serious run at uh, Vince and WWF? Yeah, I think so. Yeah? I, I think that they both have um, very good creative minds, and I think Eric was always really creative, but he just got burned out. And then he right. came back, and he seems uh, almost like a revamped, uh, reborn kind of guy. He got a whole you know, new, new lease on life kind of thing. All right. And I think Vince Russo has a lot of um, uh, imagination and uh, a lot of great ideas and stuff. And I think the two of them, I never thought that Vince Russo had a had as good a chance, like a clear opportunity to sort of prove himself, and uh, I, I, which I expressed to him. Uh, two weeks ago when I saw him for the first time right. that uh, a lot of guys I think were really happy with the job he was doing there was some question about some of the content but I mean for me in particular I was happy with what they were doing with me for the first time with the WCW I was very positive yeah didn't make a point of expressing that and uh, I wished and I think a lot of us like Ben Wan certain guys were very uh, you know pro uh, and on account of not um Making that clear, Vince Russo got sacked earlier than uh, right. a lot of us would have wanted. And so I'm glad that he's back. I think uh, Bischoff and Russo will work really well together. And that, if anything, that'll lessen the load and the burden of uh, one person having to uh, put together so much uh, thought into two or three different wrestling shows. Right, right. Um, I do have a question I have to ask. I don't want to beat a dead horse with it, but it's it's very rare that I have you here, and, and probably will be, you know, again. Uh, Beyond the Mat just came out, and Terry Funk um, sat down, and they talked about his relationship with Mick Foley, and he had made a comment that the people that you draw the most money with, you become closest to. And going back through the years, it seemed that, that in the WWF, with you and Shawn Michaels, you guys came up together in the, in the aspect that you had the feud with the Rockers, which really tore up the house shows back in the day, and then you became world champion and were defending against the up-and-coming Shawn Michaels and so on and so forth. Where, during that feud and that relationship, did you see things go wrong? Well, I think Shawn started to change just before he got the title. Right. Um, you know, but I, I, you know, I don't have any bad feelings for, for Shawn. I, I, if anything, you know, I feel bad that he got hurt Right. Uh, last year or two years ago or whatever and that he's not wrestling anymore he's, to me he was one of the greatest wrestlers I ever worked with and one of the greatest wrestlers I ever watched uh, I I feel bad that there became a rift between us but I, I, I've learned now after sort of looking back on it maybe I'm wrong mm-hmm. but I think Vince McMahon had a lot to do with the animosities between him and me and I expressed that to him the day in Montreal at the Survivor Series I know he was involved in you know every single aspect of what happened to me in the Survivor Series. Sure. Uh, I just know how Vince works now, or at least I think I do, and I think he he works best for Vince McMahon to really pit his talent against each other all the time and, yeah. and build a lot of uh, tension and heat between them over oh, a lot of things. Like I said this like about so-and-so, or did you hear what Sean said? 
he told me a lot of things that Hulk Hogan said about me that, that I found really offensive. Right. Until I found where I met Hulk years later and we talked about it. Right. So it works best for Vince to have a lot of uh, tension between his top guys because then they have uh, harder matches and they, they there's a little uh, aggression in every move that they do because they don't like each other. And so I, I don't have any bad feelings towards Sean. If anything, I come. I miss the relationship that I had with him. Yeah, yeah. Um, another guy that you've seen that you've repaired your relationship with over the years has been Ric Flair. And you were very vocal back in the day when he had left at how disappointed you were in the matches you had with him. But then when you came into WCW, you guys had a hell of a match at that pay-per-view, which you, the two of you had headlined and, and drew a, a hell of a buy rate back in that time without the Hulk Hogan's or anybody else on the pay-per-view. What changed your opinion of Ric Flair over the years? Um... This is just a whole new respect for him. I, I, I think I spoke out of uh, out of school kind of thing. I, I uh, as I got older, I started to really appreciate just how great Ric Flair was. I think he's like even now he still works harder than than most of these guys in the ring today. And right. I can't believe how he, you know, he takes that big deal off the top and stuff. <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I'm in awe of that, and I'm in awe of Terry Funk even to it for the the level of uh, commitment and punishment that they sort of still exact on their bodies and all that. But um, t I can say one thing about Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan, who both who I, I uh, prior to uh, joining the WCW, and then when I finally did see them, they were very gracious and uh, they accepted uh, geez, to, the, to the, you know, like we, we really talked about what I said and why I said it. Yeah. And uh, they were very, very good to me, and they've been really good to me since I've been in the WCW, both of them. Okay. And I consider them very good friends of mine. Excellent. Well, I have two more questions for you, and I know you have to get going. Um, it, uh, going back um, through the years, uh, it, it's it's really nice, uh, the things that you said about Sean, that, that you've gotten past that. Now, as everybody knows, Hunter, uh, Triple H over there, has really taken off. Are you, are you surprised at how much he's taken off over there, or did you see it in him? No, I think I saw it in him. Uh, I always thought certain things about his style were very good. Yeah. I think, you know, he, <laughs> sure, I don't know. I, he's a very plastic kind of guy. I don't know if uh, uh, he's a he's a decent wrestler. Right. Uh, I don't certainly don't consider him like uh, incredible or anything. I don't think he does anything really super. I guess what I I guess what Hunter's probably best at is that he does a lot. He does a lot of things nice in there. He does does well with what he works with. He doesn't do anything really fancy or too too. Uh, yeah. You know, so he, I don't know. He's he's a guy that, uh, from a dressing room standpoint, though, that I don't think um, unless he's changed a lot. I I think he's uh, he's a fishy guy to do business with. Yeah. You know, so I, I'm glad I'm not in the dressing room where he's. <laughs> guy that will stab and slash his way to the top and there's guys like that all over the rest of the business that he's one that stands out yeah yeah I don't have a lot of regard for him yeah such has been said about him by others and the uh, the final question I want to ask you for is uh, hypothetically speaking if you could take three matches out of your career to put on a videotape to as your legacy to give to your children and your grandchildren and great grandchildren off the top of your head could you name three matches for me yeah, I would probably uh, have to say the hour match with Shawn Michaels in Anaheim. Excellent. Uh, I'd have to say the WrestleMania 13 match with uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Right. And it's really a toss-up. I, I top of my head, I'd have to say either the Wembley match with the British Bulldog, mm -hmm. or uh, yeah, I would have to say the Wembley match with the British Bulldog. Well, they match the British Bulldog. Well, listen, Brett, I want to thank you very much for your time, and uh, I wish you the best of luck, and I, I really hope you get better. And uh, I know speaking for all the fans listening out there and, and reading about you, we want to see you get back in the ring, but see you back in the ring healthy and uh, not too soon. So uh, we wish you the best. Okay. Years old. Wow. And every, every Friday I was either working in some capacity in, in wrestling, from selling programs to refereeing to, to eventually... Uh, wrestling and, and, and doing it forever, it seems. Right. But it was interesting. Uh, we all had a passion for it. I think the whole family was, uh, 
you know, thrived on uh, the weekly uh, wrestling show. Huh. Interesting. Now, um, as I'm sure most of the, the wrestling public know, you're... WrestlingGodProWrestlingRadio.com presents Are you talking to me? Pro Wrestling Radio Live Online You think The Rock actually cares? What is he doing here? Oh, it's true I'm bringing everybody with me The Rock That's our time That be the man Call in with a question for Guard Julo. And that's the bottom line because Stone Cold said Get started. So. Eric Arjulo with Bret Hart for Pro Wrestling Weekly. Brett, you've just put out a book, and what I want to know is what inspired you to write that book? Uh, I just wanted to recapture some of the, sort of my great uh, accomplishments that I've made in wrestling and put them all, put, put it back out there in the light again, shed some light on different opponents from Steve Austin to Goldberg to you name it. Right, right. What was it like growing up in a wrestling family? Oh, uh, it was interesting. <laughs> I bet. At least, you know, I was around a lot of uh, a lot of interesting characters. I really have a very uh, interesting perspective. I think of of the entire business and, and and a really long one. It's funny because my dad has such an interesting perspective on the business. He's eighty five, right? And he's been in there so long. But uh, when I think about it, I've been involved in wrestling since I was about four years. Uh, six, one, can you feel? I hate your ever hold the damn full Hold three at one eight seven seven eight hundred eight eight three four. That's how I roll. Your sex at Come get some because I've done all of that. And now your host of the show, the King, is back on his throne, Eric. Eric. 